Welcome to BWI Live. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. Got a fun show for you today because we're going to be talking about the past, present, and the future of Penn State football and some hoops at the end, plus some breakout stars for 2022. That's what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be giving you our predictions about who's going to be the breakout star offense, defense, and special teams for next season. And we're going to do that in the middle portion of the show. And we're going to ask for your audience participation to vote on who you think is the right answer. We're each going to give you our individual answers and then you get to vote. The winner moves on to the next round. And of course, we will be wrapping up with our final winner uh, as we... uh, get all the votes tallied. So that's coming up later in the show. We'll be answering your questions and talking about some new information from Penn State football in terms of name, image, and likeness that came out after our conversation last week. And the people that are going to be doing that for you, we'll start with, as always, Nate Bauer, Senior Editor of Blue White Illustrated. Nate, welcome to the show. Hello. How are you? I'm doing well. I I caught you with the hello there as you drink out of your very classy looking mug. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Thank you. It, well, I mean, it, it it speaks. It evokes an emotion of a of a, a quiet New England shore. It's, yeah, it's it's nautical. There's yeah. um, it, at New York, presumably with an anchor. So. <laughs> I don't know of any rocky shorelines in New York other than, you know, whatever's happening with the Knicks. Dave Eckert follows up that <laughs> lame joke. Dave, how you doing? I'm doing swell to you, Frank. My my drinking equipment is not as classy. But, you know, <laughs> Boo. Ignored. But well, we're, uh, we're managing. That's all right. Not all of us can be Nate Bauer with his shiplap wall and trendy topics and trendy things he's got going on in his life. So we're all doing our best. And to, speaking of doing our best, we're talking about some really interesting things today on the BWI Daily Edition. Uh, excuse me, on BWI Live. Uh, we are going to be talking about name, image, and likeness, quick senior bowl update, uh, and a couple of other things that come up throughout the show. I want to start... With that NIL deal that Penn State announced with Fanatics, Nate, you wrote about this last week. Give us an update on what the who, what, why about uh, this latest announcement from Penn State. Yeah, so so Penn State didn't. Um, it was just a tease, right? Like they didn't. There was no accompanying press release. Um, but Penn State tweeted on Friday morning a an image of the Nittany Lion wearing a Penn State jersey with a name across the back, in his case, Nittany Lion. Uh, and basically, it was a tease to the fact that Penn State will be partnering with Fanatics, like the, uh, you know, they don't, I don't think they produce apparel, but they distribute apparel. They, they handle a lot of team shops for multiple professional and college athletic uh, programs and franchises. Um, and so, you know, basically the, the, the meat of the announcement is Penn State players, right? So for all these years, uh, for the last 10 or so years, the only jersey that you could buy in stores was um, either the number one, right? Like an official Penn State jersey, the number one for football, or the number of whatever year it was. So 12, 13, 14, up to obviously 22. Um, But now because of NIL, players will be able to opt in to a, an agreement and an arrangement where their Jersey can be sold. And so along with their Jersey number and uh, officially licensed Penn state Nike Jersey, it'll have their last name on the back. So um, big news, you know, I I wouldn't say it's like monumental in the scope of NIL stuff, but for Penn State, it's significant nonetheless. Yeah. So this also begs the question, Dave, is the Penn State Nittany Lions last name Nittany Lion? Because it's on the back of his jersey. It so Nittany Lion is is so Penn State is his first name. Is that the case? You know, these are I don't know the answer T Frank. 
but these are the questions that require answers. So I will dig into this for you, and yes. next week I will get an answer. Thank you very but, much. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, I think the other question that requires an answer is, are they going to put names on the back of the jerseys on game day? Is uh, that a thing that can happen now? Is that, is I that an NIL I have an answer. Game? I have an answer, answer no? for you. Yeah, the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. The answer is no. Penn State, uh, somebody actually tweeted at Penn State how horrible this was that this signified the return <laughs> of names on the back of jerseys. And the official Penn State Twitter response was that it will only be for the replica jerseys sold in stores yeah. of players. There there will not be there will not be names on the back of Penn State jerseys. More Thank likely, God. more likely <laughs> names on the back of Penn State jerseys at some point in the future or black and pink jerseys someday. Never. <laughs> Not for football. <laughs> I think it would be awesome. And I know that I'm going to be thrown into the river with uh, cement shoes for saying that. But I think just even if it was for the blue white game, I think that'd be cool. Like, isn't that a, just a li just a one time variety thing or or I, I should I go ahead and get the the yeah. the stone defined to throw around my neck for later? You do you go you do the blue white game. You do pink and black versus blue and white, you know, yeah. old versus new. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you guys have no appreciation for tradition <laughs> and I don't want to be friends with you anymore. OK. That's that's fair. That's fine. What's we'll... next? <laughs> uh, so the the obvious winner here, though, are the fans, right? So the fans finally get to have jerseys that they can wear of their favorite players with the names on the back and all that stuff. Um, how much of a difference does this make for the individual players when we get down to it, do you think, Dave? You know, I'm not sure. I, just reading the announcement, there's... There's not that much detail in there, I guess, because it's not really the announcement. It's just the teaser of the announcement. But it's it's uh, it's February, and we have we have air time to fill. But, <laughs> but oh, don't talk like that. That's just the truth. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I, it'll it'll be interesting. I mean, certainly for the guys who you'd presume that guys who have more of their jerseys sold will get more money. I would guess so. Um, I, I guess that for maybe your uh, Sean Clifford's, your Nick Singleton's, your whoever, that this might be a, a pretty big deal. Um, but yeah, I'll be interested to see how it works, um, because certainly that was not laid out for us in the announcement. Uh, Nate, you've been doing a good bit of work on this. Uh, is this you said it's it's an incremental step, not the biggest step forward for the landscape but um is this a jumping off point is there gonna be more stuff coming do you think or is this just the necessary first step to you know open up revenue streams for the university and for the players so so uh, yes i think it's i mean certainly for penn state it is i think on the broader scale this is the um opening shot toward a NCAA football game returning to yep. right PlayStation, etc., to, to gaming consoles. Um, there will be like this this idea of a an organization. You know, in in this case, it's Learfield or somebody, right? Somebody is organizing college athletic players to say, "Hey, we have arranged for a deal." You will opt into it if you want. And at that point, your jersey can be sold through Nike. You'll get a cut in the mail every month, right? For however many jerseys are sold, they'll receive a percentage. It's like a, a, a residual or a royalties check that people who write books or TV shows, right? Um, they get those. Uh, and so... It, it preempts that, right, is is now in the future, there will be the same organization that says, okay, opt in and you can have, you can be in the video game and you'll get a slice, right? 20, 25 cents a month or whatever it is uh, that, it, that it works out to for as many players as there are. Um, but specific to Penn State, yeah, I mean, it, it, if it's, if it's, if it's not the appetizer 
it needs to be the appetizer. Like this cannot possibly be the main dish of what Penn State is doing on an NIL front. There needs to be more after this that standardizes and and institutionalizes the opportunity for these guys to all make money in some capacity. Is is there anyone that wouldn't opt in? What would be the reasons for not opting in? Can you have your own individual deal? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I my guess would be that players who feel as though they have better bargaining power than the collective mm -hmm. will want to like it, it might become an attractive option for them, but I would guess like is Sean Clifford going to be able to negotiate with Nike, right? Ne Sean Clifford's ne team. Right. Exactly. So maybe it's something you do where you, you want to withhold that from somebody else being able to make money off of your name. That's more than the cut that you feel like you're getting. But my guess overwhelmingly is 99.9% .9 of players in college football are going to be ecstatic yeah. to participate in something like this, even if the kickback is pennies. What about basketball, Dave? And how does that work? I know that uh, shoe deals are a huge thing when it comes to, and apparel deals in general are a huge thing that come, when it comes to basketball, a little more of an individual sport. How do you see that playing out for maybe not Penn State, but some of the other bigger schools that get one and dones and superstars that go on to the next level? Yeah, I again, I I'm not sure about Penn State because again, we know that the the basketball market at Penn State probably isn't what it is at some of the other, um, I guess more historically successful schools. But definitely, I mean, this is going to be huge. It's going to be enormous. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, you touched on it there, sneakers, uh, all that stuff. So you know, your Dukes, your North Carolinas, your Michigan States, your UCLA's, like you know, there's going to be there's going to be a bidding war um, I, for, for who can support these guys um, financially in, in the best way. And, you know, the, the dynamic that basketball has to contend with is a little bit different to football in that in basketball, there is a path to professional basketball that doesn't include college, right? You can go to the, is it the G League? Is that what we're calling it now? I think we're I think still so. calling it the G uh, League. Yeah. Okay. You can go to the G League and you can do that. So I guess, you know, the opportunity to get these kids paid at the college level kind of does give college basketball maybe a little bit of a, um, you know, a, a weapon against that. Um, but, yeah, it's 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 a different dynamic and a very different dynamic at Penn State. Yeah, um, it'll be interesting to say. see how players trademarking their own brands and all these things fold into this particular situation, I think more specifically in basketball, but you see guys uh, that go onto the NFL and then have their own brand and their own thing that they have going on. Uh, we'll see. It's just, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. I, I've always thought that if, if you're looking for money to pay players or to give them a, a cut of things, like why is it not in your Penn State's contract with Nike that are athletes on the field that are modeling your jerseys and looking great in them they also get a piece of this, and this seems to be, I mean, a part of that, but not specifically with the, with one particular apparel brand. It's with, you know, a, a third-party company. So just interesting, interesting to see how this is going to play out over the next uh, year and a half while we find all of the pitfalls, which is going to happen. Uh, so a couple of other things we want to talk about on the show today. First off is what you want to talk about, the BWI live show here on Monday at noon, covering a wide variety of Penn State topics from on the field, off the field. We're going to be talking about recruiting in just a little bit. But whatever questions you may have, drop them in the chat. We'll be talking to you about things you have on your mind. Uh, that's coming up in just a little bit. And, of course, if you want to donate to the channel, Super Chats are always super appreciated. And we'll make sure that your question, your comment, your statement, as long as it is not vulgar and it is not uh, inflammatory in some way, gets on the screen. Nate, Come you have a problem now. with that? Come free, on now, guys. Free speech? We're all I say the more here. vulgar, the better. Oh, Dave. you guys are—you guys really love making my job easy, don't you? You really <laughs> love making my job easy. 
Uh, so the Senior Bowl happened this weekend, and I know, Nate, you were watching, and, and if you want to sign up for Blue White Illustrated and follow along, we have game chats for everything, even the Senior Bowl, watching Why Jesse not? Lucetta on, uh, he was on the uh, American side? The American yeah. side, okay. yes, the American side. So after watching, what were your thoughts on how he performed at defensive end full-time? He had a great, Whole great game. day. Great day for uh, Jesse Lucetta at defensive end the whole game. I don't know why he was announced as a linebacker for the official senior bowl, you know, unveiling the, the week and a half prior to the game, but yeah, no, he, he was, he was very good. He wasn't. <clears throat> and, and this is, and I think that you can speak to this maybe a little bit better than I can T Frank, but it's not that he was a dominant presence on every play. Right. Like, I mean, he, he got washed out a couple of times. Uh, he, he wasn't active in everything, but specifically he had two sacks and one was a strip sack during a potential scoring opportunity for the other team. Uh, and then the, the last was in the fourth quarter when the other team was kind of making a, a late comeback. The national team was making a late comeback and both were like, Big, you know, again, I mean, we're speaking in the context, obviously, of an, an all-star game, but they were big plays in the context of the game. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I would think that he probably made some money for himself, uh, demonstrating and exhibiting that he can compete against future NFL. Uh, let me think about this. He was on the left side of the line, so right tackles yep. um, for yep. most of the game. Um, but yeah, I mean, he... I don't think that he could have asked for a better day for what he was asked to do. Yeah, and we saw some flashes. Now, I have an opinion about uh, Daniel Falele from uh, uh, Minnesota in general, but we saw a lot of highlights of Jesse Lucetta coming uh, in the week as well when he was going against uh, some of the other players at that position in the Senior Bowl. There are still moments where you watch him learning to rush the passer. So there was one particular play that that uh, happened in the first half of the game where he absolutely whips the tackle, fakes outside, goes inside. The guy almost falls over trying to reach inside, and then Lucetta spins back outside because he thinks he hasn't won it yet. So yep. I, there are some. He's still learning to rush the passer, but at 260 pounds, he put on weight between the end of the season and the Senior Bowl, and it showed up in his power and his power through contact. So those are all big things. And then it's about projection, right? The NFL draft. There are certain players that go uh, sooner than they should from a film perspective because, like Jesse Lucetta, they're six foot three they've got 33 plus inch arms they're 260 and I imagine he's gonna run in the four sevens maybe in the four sixes somewhere in there probably not the elite speed guy but with great twitch he's gonna have a great 10 yard split he's gonna be what the NFL is looking for from that defensive end position so then it's about you know how what's the what's his ceiling as a pass rusher and you're right about making himself some money because we saw him in that scenario, in that situation, let loose as a pass rusher, and he was productive, which is the thing he wasn't at Penn State this past season when he was still learning to rush the passer and a little bit undersized. So a good a good week from Jesse Lucetta, but I'm always a little hesitant to put too much into one all-star game. Is that fair, Dave? Or, or, or is this, you think, the projection and the trajectory of where Lucetta is going? Yeah, look, I mean, I've never put too many, too much stock in any of these things. I Full disclosure, I didn't watch it. <laughs> you know, like that that's kind of where I'm at with it, to be honest with you. But, uh, you know, I mean, they are what they are. They're, they're showcase opportunities and opportunities to present yourself in, in, in ways that maybe you weren't able to present yourself during the season, right? I mean, Jesse Lucada in this game, he's not making sacrifices for the sake of Penn State winning football games. Yep. You know, he's like, I'm going to go and I'm going to do what I need to do to get myself an NFL drop contract to, uh, to to get drafted in the NFL. And I think that's a valuable opportunity. Um, how much stock do you put into it? Again, I don't know. It's kind of like 
the Pro Bowl, right? I mean, the you know, it's, it's like, a little little I'm, more on the line than the Pro Bowl, but your point yeah, is taken you that know, it's an All Star game. Like, mm, I, you know, I I think it I think it is it more closely parallels summer camps for Penn State football the way that mm-hmm. they look at right. So uh, in, in high school recruiting, and these guys are what tenth grade, eleventh grade when they go to a Penn State summer camp, mostly ninth and tenth graders actually. Uh, Penn State has seen film of these guys. They've seen tons of high school film. You're yep. able to evaluate it. You, you've gotten all the numbers, but you're not you're not quite as sure until you see them in person. That's what the Senior Bowl is. The yep. Senior Bowl is you get to do all of this stuff live and in person in front of a ton of NFL scouts, NFL GMs, NFL personnel before the combine setting. And so that's, I mean, to me, I think that that's what you take away from it is, look, they're not play, like the right tackles and the offensive linemen on the national side. They're not playing in that game thinking to themselves, oh, it's okay if I loaf this play, like uh, yeah, as right. though you're not trying it. And yeah. so you, you are putting good on good in that scenario. Um, and I, you know, I thought he acquitted himself pretty nicely. And, and it's also a situation that, it's not the best of the best. And I, the Senior Bowl does a great job of marketing, but these are guys, for the most part, like Lucetta, that need to prove something to NFL GMs. So guys are coming in, and they are putting the work in, but you're learning a new offense, and there's a lot of mental mistakes. Like, you're going to have some mental mistakes. So there are some skews to that, but I think you're absolutely right as far as the things he needed to demonstrate. He did that throughout the week and then in the game. Nate, you are... Uh, all-star game correspondent you watched the yeah. Shriner Bowl as well so sure Congo and Ellis Brooks <laughs> were in that one how who stood out who made plays what happened yeah uh so Congo is Derek Tangelo. he was good he was good I, I mean I think that you saw a couple of the clips that I passed along he was good um in that game he had a bull rush that flat out knocked over. I don't know if that was the guard or the center, but he just ran somebody over um, on a play that actually happened to be a quarterback fumble. He didn't see the fumble, um, but no, he, he played well. And Ellis Brooks, I, I thought had a better day in his run stopping than pass, right? Like, which is probably pretty predictable. Um, but no, I mean, I thought, I thought both of those guys played fairly well. And then the last guy that I want to mention is Jordan Stout in the senior bowl. Um, Right. Like not not that anybody is, uh, you know, going nuts over the punters and kickers in a senior bowl, uh, but he exclusively punted. I thought that was significant. He, he didn't take any uh, PATs or field goals uh, and he absolutely crushed the ball as a punter. Uh, his first punt was 65 yards. Yeah. So no, I thought I thought uh, everybody that participated for Penn State over the weekend and Thursday, obviously in the Shriner Bowl, uh, fared nicely for themselves. A couple of guys uh, did not participate in uh, um, Arnold Ebikidi and Treat Castro Fields. Interesting, we'll get to that in just a second. But going back to our conversation about uh, the Nittany Lion. Uh, we need to give him a proper name, says Zach. And Ben says, I hope they go with something Amish to celebrate the heritage of Center County, like Ezekiel the Lion. Uh, thoughts on Ezekiel the Lion from the panel? Yay or nay? I'm not touching it with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> don't cancel me. I don't know. Uh... <laughs> if there's one group of people that are not going to cancel you, it's the Amish. They don't use electricity or have the internet. <laughs> They're not watching. Let's, let's, <laughs> they, might, they might be on Rumspringer right now, okay? They might be. They're watching BWI Live on, on you know. They Notorious get the football can... fans, those Amish. Yeah. Uh, the great Amish that make your your excellent furniture makers, excellent furniture makers. Uh, getting back on track with the show. T- <laughs> <laughs> getting to your questions in just a second. Some good stuff here in the chat that I want to make sure we get time for. Uh, but also, Penn State's future in 2022 and beyond is obviously not in a vacuum. You have other teams that have their own offseason storylines, and one of them that was I'm just going to say it weird last week was Jim Harbaugh and the situation at Michigan. 
there has been a lot of turnover in a very short time for the Wolverines. Both of their coordinators have now left. Harbaugh went to interview with the Vikings in the NFL for nine hours. The reporting was that he was going to be the next coach at one point in the day. And then magically, poof, he's back at Michigan two or three hours later. A week after that, Josh Gaddis now the offensive coordinator at Miami for Mario Cristobal. Dave, what do you make of all of this for Michigan? Um, as a Vikings fan, I'm glad that Jim Harbaugh is not my head coach. But, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, it's weird, isn't it? It's just like it's, it's you know, Penn State fans are, I think, accustomed to the dance, right? We've seen the James Franklin dance with USC a, a, a couple times. And I think generally the the interpretation that we've taken from that has been you know it's leverage right but but clearly this this went to a point beyond leverage with Jim Harbaugh um so yeah I mean if you're if you're a Michigan fan it makes you feel kind of crappy you know um here's your head coach spending as you said nine hours um you know, interviewing for an NFL job. And and so what does that mean for the future of your program? What do these departures uh, from your coordinators mean for the future of your program? So yeah, it's, it's, it's not been a banner week or so um, for the folks in Ann Arbor. I don't think. I mean, with all of that, there's a real possibility has absolutely no impact on the program. Where do you fall on that scale? Cause I agree with you, Dave, like it's weird. It, you would think these things would have an impact, but Nate, what's your, I know it's from way far away. We don't cover Michigan, but just in general, your sense of whether or not these things have as much weight as we think they do when it comes to coaches interviewing, leaving that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I, I would tend to think it is more overblown than it is a, a an actual impact. I mean, I get, I look like, Defensive, a different defensive coordinator, a different offensive coordinator in the same off season, I think is a lot. Okay. Uh, I don't want to tell you this, but Penn state has a different defensive coordinator and a different special teams coordinator this off season. Now, right. maybe, maybe we're going to downplay special teams, but um, you know, college football is this now. Yeah. for everyone and especially if you've had success so the fact that michigan has to deal with this i don't the the thing that stands out to me is before josh gaddis michigan's offense looked pretty much the same as it did once gaddis came yeah and so the thing your intentionality in terms of who you want to be now again the style might be a little bit different. The execution might be a little bit different, but it comes from the head coach yeah. in terms of what, what do you want to be? What, it, what are you going to hang your hat on? Um, and so I think, I think that like, if I had to guess Michigan's offense will continue to have three or four dumb gimmicky plays a game that, ruffle everybody's feathers and then otherwise be pretty oatmeal for the other four quarters. Yeah. 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 Uh, a couple of, a <laughs> couple of things uh, in that, in that vein, the time, like the timing this late in the process, he's interviewing on the traditional national signing day. Gaddis leaves after the traditional national signing date. Does that, we're now into February when these moves are happening. I know Mike McDonald, the defense coordinator, that one made a lot of sense. He went back to the Ravens, is their new DC. So that that's a, that's an obvious thing. Josh Gaddis leaving to Miami. I, I'm going to get into my opinion on that in just a second. But do you think that the timing has any effect whatsoever on Michigan and their progress this offseason to repeat as Big Ten champions? Um, You know, I think it probably has an impact on the pool of candidates you can use to, you, you know, you can draw from to replace, uh, definitely. Um, so yeah, I think there's an impact there. Um, instead of having, you know, 95% of the fish in the ocean, maybe now you have 50. So, you know, it's, it's, there's definitely, it definitely matters, um, whether or not I think they hit on 
their first target or their second choice. I think if they don't, then maybe you can see it start to get ugly. Um, but I, I don't think it's like sound the panic, the panic bells yet. But yeah, it's 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 an awkward situation, I would say. That would probably be the adjective I would use. Yeah, and, and Nate, you, you made a good point about the way the offense looked under Jim Harbaugh and Josh Gaddis. And the story that I thought was uh, interesting before, I think it was either before the Penn State game or before the Big Ten Championship game, or one of the big games, they essentially said about Jim Harbaugh, he retooled the whole staff, he went to the offensive coordinator, and... What I got from all of those stories was he came to Josh Gaddis and said, you're running my offense or you're leaving because what they did the previous two or three seasons under Josh Gaddis looked nothing like what they did last season as far as power, counter, run the football, pulling guards, traditional Bo, Schembe Bo Schembechler would be proud. And Josh Gaddis, I think, had one season of that and was like, yeah, I'm out. I, I I think that that's pretty clear to me that it it was it was an ultimatum and Jim Harbaugh went full Jim Harbaugh and he was rewarded for it this year. Is that sustainable? That has been my question about uh, Michigan and their success this past year for the next season and the season after that is can you sustain sustain that level of success with such a monolithic approach to things? of we obviously know where we're going with the football, you obviously know where we're going with the football, and when that happens and you play a team in the college football playoff, you get the result that you get. Also against Iowa, where they didn't score points for like 35 minutes. So this is going to be interesting, is what does the offense look like next year? Because it's going to look the same, but do you have the same success and the same results? And I just, I don't believe Jim Harbaugh came back willingly, and I don't believe that Jim Harbaugh is staying forever, like he keeps saying. I, the, the, he's not done chasing the NFL. I think there are other opportunities he wanted to get to that he couldn't this year, and that's really why he's back at Michigan. So, But, of course, he did it in a really weird, force, forced way. A really weird and forced way. Speaking of weird and forced ways, let's go and talk uh, to the audience and see what we have in the chat. Um, and that's me forcing that transition. Your questions and your comments are all exceptional. Ben asks, will there be equi equitability throughout the country? Um, will the SEC continue to try to outgame other conferences in revenue sports? I think he's talking about NIL and the landscape as it is with different rules state by state when it comes to ability to generate income for the students uh nate your thought there yeah i just want to make something clear uh the big 10 was the first conference to try to outgame everyone else with a television network of its own that was outgaming every other con like this has been going on for all of eternity and will continue to be the case of you better be acting in a way that will help your conference stand out, draw the most talent, right? The best personnel uh, and, and stay competitive nationally. And I don't think that Penn state or the big 10, I should say is positioned right now to do that. Like the, the, the they better figure it out uh, as a conference moving forward. Dave. Yeah. You know, same, <clears throat> kind of on the same boat. I think the SEC is playing a little bit of a different sport right now. Um, and and Penn State, had, Penn State in the Big Ten and the ACC and the Pac-12 and all these other conferences that that want to and and view themselves on the same level need to get there somehow. Um, and and I don't think they're that close to doing that. Uh, Zach has a question, and this is an interesting uh, thing that I think we're going to have an answer for pretty clearly. Should you make names on the back of the jerseys a part of the Generations of Greatness uniform? Um, at least with the all whiteout games. Uh, I think this is... Hold on. That was the question I was trying to pull up. Uh, oh, here. this is. Should we make Generations of Greatness our primary uniform? Make an away version of that. He thinks it'd be cool, at least for the whiteout games. You guys... I, I like the Generations of Greatness game uh, uniform. I think it's pretty cool. I think it's pretty clean. I don't know if you guys are big Jersey guys when it comes to, like, the aesthetic of them. I'm usually not. But do you have any thoughts on how important that is 
uh, to Penn State fans and, and making any alterations to the jersey uh, outside of black and pink or names on the jerseys? Anyone Dave. can take this. <laughs> okay. I, 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 am, I am here for any and all variety in the jerseys, and I know that will get me hung from the gallows, but I just do – I'm here for different. Different, fun, new. Give it to me. Um, no. Yeah. That's... Okay. Let's move on. No. Uh, no. Nate... No. I don't. I don't like it. I am. I am going to be the voice of the cranky people. I'm just gonna leave it at that. The cranky people, and just say, look, like, I, I'm. It is what it is. I grew up uh, as a little kid as a big Penn State fan. All fandom has since been wiped clean of me into objective journalist territory. But I, I think objectively, Penn State has great uniforms. Why? I, I don't understand the obsession with changing it. And in fact, I would like the Big Ten Conference logo to be removed because I think that looks pretty stupid. <laughs> yeah, I'm give I'm me, all for removing logos with you. I'm with you as well. And you give you me make the Nike swoosh, blue, white. It's over. Call it a day. I I okay. Not that I really want to continue the jersey conversation, but I tend to agree with Nate. It's the idea that there is no conversation for a one-off situation, like. There, there cannot be a conversation about a one-off situation. Uh, every once in a while, I'm like, okay, here's a thing that they do. Doesn't matter, though. I want to move on to Dave's question. Ohio State <laughs> staff got better this offseason. Did Penn State get better, or are they pulling further away? The premise here is that Ohio State's staff got better this offseason because they went out and got uh, Knowles from Oklahoma State as the defense coordinator. He was the number one name this offseason. So, Nate, do you agree with the premise? And do you think that they where, – where do you land on David's question? I, I mean, I think Manny Diaz is a pretty splashy hire, to be honest with you. <laughs> like, I, I, I don't I, – I understand that maybe we view things in the bubble of Penn State, but, like, Manny Diaz was a very successful defensive coordinator before he became a head coach. And I think if we're being honest, he wasn't unsuccessful as a head coach, um, you, you know, in that league, um, which isn't great, but you have this one dominant program, like he tended to do fairly well against just about everybody else. So to pick somebody up like that, on short notice who can step in for your defensive coordinator who just became a head coach at Virginia Tech. I, I don't know. To me, that feels like a, a win and something, a guy who probably other programs would have loved to have gotten a crack at. Dave, uh, your thoughts on where Penn State landed this offseason after the coaching carousel? Yeah, I think they did fine. You know, I mean, I, I guess I have a little bit I, I disagree a little bit in just the whole idea of like evaluating staff hires before we know how they do, <laughs> you know, um, because look, I mean, we all expected Penn state's offense to be this great, you know, amazing offense last season. And it wasn't. So, you know, I mean, it, it's not, I, I, I don't, I don't think reputation dictates immediate success with all of these. And, and I would apply that to, Jim Knowles at Ohio State and and you know all of yeah. the other big splashy big splashy hires. So do you know, to be determined, do you know, I guess. Do you know why Jim Knowles is going to be really successful at Ohio State? They have really good, Ohio players. State has good football players. Yeah. You guys <laughs> you guys killed it. That's the uh, right answer. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. And I, Manny Diaz is a good hire for a lot of different reasons. I, I think that's a fair point. Um there is just it speaks to and I think it speaks to Dave's underlying feeling of and what James Franklin has said, you're you're either winning these daily battles or you're not winning these daily battles. So getting a guy that is a good player, a good coach and, and a good fit, I think that's a win. But it's not I don't know that it's necessarily a zero sum game in the offseason. I think that's the best way to put it of, you know, you didn't get. Uh, Kevin Knowles, I think is what you said his name was. You didn't get that guy, but you got yeah, a guy who's Jim. Thank you. Jim Knowles. 
Kevin Knowles is his alter ego. So it's it's not a one to one ratio. You're not winning or losing every single one. You got a guy who is a good fit that's going to continue what you want on the defense. Last question we're going to get to because we are uh, we went a little long on nil this uh, at the beginning of the show. If thoughts on if Penn State was in the Big Ten West, Nate, I, this is a conversation we've had about the equi- uh, equity in the two conferences for several years now. Hypothetical: Penn State's in the Big Ten West. West are they in? The college football playoff once, zero times, um, championship game. What do you think? They would be in the the Big Ten championship game in, <clears throat> let's think about this, uh, 16, 17, certainly 19, uh, even with the loss to Minnesota. Uh, yeah, so no, three, I mean, three three Big Ten West um, division titles probably in the last five years, uh, six years. So, no, I mean, I, look, like, I, I, I just I just think it is foolish to pretend as though that side of the conference is in any way comparable to Michigan State, Michigan, Ohio State, and Penn State all being in the East. They're just, they're just yeah. I, I'm sorry, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa being the standard bearers on that side of the division, it's not, that's not, they're not good. Like, they're not good, that level good. Husaria asks, see a lot of noise about new offensive line recruits. Thanks to on three. Is Trout coming into his own, Dave? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, you got to be excited about about the, the ratings um, of the new prospects that Penn State is getting. Um, Jevin Williams, I think, is a top 150 guy. Um, Borderline top 100. Um, Alex Berkmeyer, another guy, top 100 kid. So um, the 2023 class looks great on the offensive line. Uh, um, it looks like uh, Phil Troutwine is is doing what he needs to do in in recruiting. Um, but I think before those kids even get here and put themselves in a position. Um, to play and, 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 and be options. You, you, there's improvement that needs to be made with the people that are already on campus. Um, yeah, so, I think that's, yeah, that's he, a, that's a fair point. And it, these players are coming in for the class of 22, 23 and 24. So right. it's not going to necessarily change the factors on the football field this year. That's where a transfer would come in or one of these guys in 22 playing above their level and actually playing as a true freshman, which we saw Landon Tangwall didn't even do that. So it's going to take an exceptional player to do to do that something specifically. And that's even with James Franklin saying that uh, Vega Ioane can come in and contribute early. I don't know what that particularly means, if it means depth starting special teams. So there is some optimism, but you're right. It has to eventually trickle onto the football field. We got to move on because we got to play our game this week when it comes to uh, getting people involved and getting us to compete against each other. See who's going to win, who's going to lose this week as we go into some of the predictions for 2022. Get this set up here for you. What is... Uh, your prediction for the Penn State breakout player on offense. Here's how this is going to work. Uh, the guys are going to give their case. They're going to give their player. They're going to give their reasoning. And then you in the chat are going to vote as to who you think has the best answer. Uh, and then I'll make sure in the chat you know when we're closing down the voting so that you can get your vote in and whoever is the best two in the first two rounds move on to our third round. So Nate up first. Let's see if I can do all of this right. Uh, he is going with Nate. You are going with Nick Singleton as a breakout player on offense in 2022 state your case, please. He, uh, Penn state needs a really good running back and he was the best one in the country last year. So that's it. That's the whole case. Um, it's, it, (laughs) it is like, if he's not Penn state's breakout player, uh, I think that we'll be having very similar conversations, uh, after the season. That we are this year, dear Lord, I don't want to. I don't want to have the same conversation <laughs> next year. Okay, so, um, Dave, you're up next, and you picked Theo Johnson. Tell me why Theo Johnson is the breakout player in 2022. Well, I was going to accuse Nate of cheating for picking a true freshman first off, but then I realized that I did that for special teams, so I'm gonna I'm gonna skip that. But you know, I I think 
Theo Johnson is he has all of the physical traits. He has proven, um, you know, at the at the high school level and in flashes in college that he can he can be an effective receiver of the football. And I think that Penn State desperately needs that from its tight end position and did not get it this year. So another year older, another year wiser. He has all the the physical tools and gifts that he needs. Um, I think he's he's the guy. And I'm going to go with my guy Landon Tangwall. Um, here's the deal. Uh, if Nick Singleton's going to be a breakout player or if uh, Theo Johnson's going to be a breakout player, something needs to happen on the offensive line. And the best possible candidate for change up front right now is the redshirt freshman who played very well last season, was a mature player coming into the season, and uh, he is slotted to start and be one of the best players on the front five. And, and, and that might be dangerous to say about a freshman who we've only seen less than 200 snaps from, but I think that is, I, I just see too many things in him that are difference making along the offensive line that are good, solid, fundamental, strong things. And he's going to be getting bigger and stronger as a player this off season. So a high starting base, but the question then becomes, is he a breakout player if these other guys do break out? And uh, we're wrapping up the voting here. Last closing arguments from you will go in reverse order. Dave, last closing arguments for Theo Johnson. Anything you want to rebut from what other people said? Not really. I'll be nice. I just think he's, he's good at football. Um, and he's good at football in a position where Penn State needs somebody that's good at football. So... You know, I, 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 I won't negatively campaign here. Nate, drag us into the mud. Yeah, I mean, that was nice uh, and sound reasoning. But, uh, you know, look, I, I picked the slam dunk. I picked the slam dunk. I, I don't know what else to tell you. Like, they <laughs> desperately, desperately. It's <sighs> Penn State has a lot of very, very serviceable pieces. Like, I mean, that's to me, the, the clearest part of last season was if you looked at Penn state's offense, you saw a middling quarterback, uh, surrounded by pieces that when asked to carry more of a load, couldn't outside of Jahan Dotson, right? Jahan Dotson was a superstar, but that was it. Like there was nobody else to talk about. They, you have to have a couple of those. There needs to be two, three, four. The more you have, the more success you're going to have. And so Nick Singleton represents that for Penn State moving forward. I know it's a lot of pressure to put on his shoulders, but like that's the standard that he's bringing uh, to Penn State upon his arrival. We may be uh, experiencing the first thing I feared uh, with bef uh, that I, I was worried about might happen last week which is that, uh, and it didn't last week, that I believe the chat's a little bit behind us on the video. So our vote is going to go to Nate for having the correct answer and yes. for having the most <laughs> positive answers in the chat. But we, uh, uh, the audience participation a little bit lagging because I think the video is a little lagging today. So apologies for that. I'm going to vamp here for a little longer, and then we're going to get into our breakout player on defense. So guys... We're going to go into defense now. Your breakout player for defense is Nate as the winner of the first round. Give us why Adisa Isaac is your guy. Yeah, you know, it's I'm I'm gaming the system a little bit here because uh, there's probably an argument to be made that he has already broken out to a certain extent. But, um, you know, out of sight, out of mind a little bit and having not played this past season, coming off an injury, I, I just feel like he has been and continues to be a guy who's probably being overlooked a little bit, right, in, in terms of the assessment and the outlook for what Penn State's defensive line is going to be. And the reality, again, is you're talking about a position that has the opportunity to change games. Not a run stuffer, you know, blue collar work pail guy, uh, a, a guy who can sack the quarterback, strip the ball and deliver, <laughs> deliver the ball back to his offense. Like, I mean, I, I just think that's what it comes down to. And he's a guy who has the potential to bring that this, this next season. 
So Nate is going with a six foot three, two hundred and forty four pound defensive end who doesn't play the run. Dave, you are going with Kalen so? King. <laughs> I am absolutely going to sway the voting on this one. Dave, you're going with Kalen King. Give your reasons why Kalen King is the breakout player for this next season. Um, Because I think Kalen King played very well as a true freshman. Um, I think he has already earned the staff's trust. Um, and Penn State needs another corner, um, you know, this, this, to fill that spot from Tree Castor Field. So I think, you know, Kalen King ascending uh, his snap count and stepping into maybe a starting spot works. Um, I, I would expect, you know, at this point, that would be my guess as to what's to happen based on snap counts last year. I think he's probably ahead of Johnny Dixon. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, just James Franklin has glowed about this guy. You can tell that James Franklin loves Kalen King. Kalen King did some really nice things, uh, it, you know, last season. So I would expect him to take that next step. Um, an in, in increased opportunity in 2022. I'm going to go with Jalen Reed in the secondary, but a different position. And here is my reason why. Last season, people keep asking me, T. Frank, what's the difference between what you've seen from Manny Diaz and from Brent Pry? Tell us the difference. Tell us the difference. And, and really, it's going to come down to defensive personnel to me. And the way Manny Diaz was unafraid to use multiple safeties and to use some of them in the box as linebackers on third down, obvious passing situations to try and confuse the defense of where they're going to line up and how they're going to line up. I think Jalen Reed is the guy that can make all of that go. I think he is a, a strong candidate to be a breakout player because he's going to get his hands on the football and he's going to be used in sub packages in ways that are going to be uh, putting him in positions to make plays. So Kalen King is going to be on the football field. Sure. He's going to be locking down guys. Maybe he doesn't get thrown at. Maybe he does this is going to be a guy that I think is going to has a chance to be featured in the defense and in the chat. I have now run away with it. The winner oh, no. is T uh, Frank. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we're going to move on. And uh, Dave, you have been eliminated because you did not win the first round. Nate and I are moving on to the finals for special yes. teams. <laughs> So this is going to be a little bit tricky. So we're going to see if we can do this, execute this uh, in real time. And it's already not going well. There we go. Special teams players. De uh, Nate, who did you pick for your special teams player? Honestly, I don't remember now. But, uh, Dave stole my answer. And he's eliminated, right? Yes. So I can steal his answer. You can. Which is punter Alex Bacchetta. There you go. <laughs> I've... Yeah, I've taken over Dave's choice. Thank you, Dave, for your choice. Uh, who, who did I pick? I picked Sander uh, Sahidek. Well, the picture is a Pachetta, so go with it. Yeah, so, well, no, I mean, look, uh, I think that Jordan Stout's impact was far greater than he will ever truly get credit for. Like, Penn State could have lost more games by more points had he not been as effective as he was helping that defense, right? Like, I mean, he just put teams in a bind constantly. And I think Penn State desperately needs somebody to be able to step into that role and have the same type of success. Do you expect that for a true freshman punter? Probably not, maybe not, but certainly if he can approximate it, um, you know, he's the guy who I think we'll be talking about after the season. So that's he's a great the answer. Hunter in the country for by Cole's kicking also. So, so that's great. Thanks, Dave. That, yeah, that's that, 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 that's all great points, points to Nate. Uh, we're going to go with Cam Miller and Cam Miller. Here's the thing about punt returning and kick returning. First off, he's great at it. Secondly, no one knows anything about Cam Miller on the college football level yet. So I'm considering the fact that even though Penn State has struggled to get kick and punt returns in the past, the unknown of a guy like Cam Miller who has great talent at this is going to A, allow him to win it as a freshman, get him involved in the offense or in the special teams early, but 
he's also going to have success because people are going to actually punt to him. And Jahan Dotson, after his success in 2020, did not see a lot of great opportunities to uh, to actually return punts and make a difference on that side of the ball. It's hard to do, but just consider the fact, too, that the more punts you have and the more kicks you have, the more mistakes you can possibly have. If you have two kick returns that are good in a season, people remember that. So Cam Miller is going to be our breakout player on special teams. That is going to be our last uh, our last one of the uh, of the show today. And I am going to do this thing where I just admit defeat and that the lag took over that particular part of the show. Nate, as as the guest on the show, you get to win today. So any hey. final remarks that you would like to give any any uh, acceptance speech you'd like to make, you can make it now. Yeah, uh, the return game doesn't matter anymore, T. Frank. You're way off uh, the the just in general. It's no longer part of the game. You've already won. I, you don't you don't have to convince anybody. You don't have to kick a man while he's down. Yeah, I know, yeah, I know. But I, I like I like five minutes after my point is made to see all of the chat responses like rile me up a little bit more. So yeah, you're you're way off, T. Frank. Okay. Uh, let's move on to basketball. Let's round out the show with a little bit of basketball with the five minutes we have left uh, in our hour-long BWI live show. Thanks to everybody who participated. We're going to make sure that that works better next week because we had a great, I had a fun time with it the first week. We'll make sure that everything is a little bit cleaned up so that we have it going into uh, off-season because I love having the audience participate. You guys do an awesome job and you have a lot of interesting, thoughtful questions that we want to make sure we get to and we want to make sure we have some fun with you here on BWI Live. Uh, but of course, Blue White Illustrated covers more than just football, although that's all I see personally is football. But these two here are expert basketball reporters and uh, making some waves under uh, uh, Michael Shrewsbury, first year head coach. And then the Lions Hoops is now a little bit back and forth. Lost a game 51 49 against Wisconsin on the road. Both you guys last week said that it was going to be a tough game. How did it play out? Dave, Nate, you've been talking too much because you won. Now you get to go into timeout. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a just disgusting basketball game. I just <laughs> absolutely <laughs> abysmal. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, I think Penn State scored three points in the first 12 minutes of the game and went into the game down it went into halftime down only five somehow <laughs> um, because Wisconsin didn't score either. Uh, it was, it, you know, Penn State, Penn State had some travel problems. They didn't get to Madison until like two hours before tip. Uh, so, oh, clearly, oh, I thought you I meant, think, I thought you meant they were taking too many steps. They literally had travel problems. Yes, That's they not literally great. literally had travel problems. Uh, not ideal. Um, you kind of think, how does this game turn out if, you know, maybe they make three shots in the first 12 minutes instead of one. Uh, and maybe they're in a little bit of a, of a rhythm after their travel nonsense. But yeah, you know, it, it's it's not a game that you expected them to win. Wisconsin's good. They're the number 11 team in the country. Um, but it, you do come out of it feeling like, you know, Wisconsin just scored the fewest points they have in like three years. That was a little bit of a missed opportunity. Um to, 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 to get a big road win, which has kind of eluded Penn State. So, yeah, um, gross game, disgusting. Um, if you're a Penn State fan, you're probably pleased with the defensive effort. You're pleased that you didn't get blown out because let me that's ask, what I thought would happen. Let, but, let me ask Nate about that. So you have sure. a strong defensive effort, and you have three points in 12 minutes. Uh, better or worse, which one do you think? And is this defense ever going to crack them a couple wins? Because they have been close in a lot of these games that they've been giving defensive effort, but the offense still seems to be an issue. So how do you square that in this game that we knew was going to be low scoring, but was low scoring by low scoring standards? Yeah, they're, I mean, they're just streaky. Like, that's just the, the reality is they've had these, these scoring droughts have not been unique to one game. Uh, I mean, it's been pretty consistent throughout the season that they've had these long, long stretches where they just couldn't score. And then, 